So I would like to invite Professor Ji Sung Park, Assistant Professor of Public Policy at the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA to the podium for his presentation, How Heat Hurts, The Hidden Cost of a Warmer World. All right. Thank you, Mac uh, and Ido and everyone at Radcliffe uh, for putting together this event. Uh, and it's really good to be in person. I know many are joining us remotely uh, as well. Um, so once again, my name is Ji Sung Park. Uh, I am an assistant professor at UCLA. Uh, my professional training is as an environmental economist. In fact, much of that training was received just two blocks that way uh, in the Harvard Econ Department. And I'd like to share uh, some emerging work from within my field today uh, about what you might call some of the hidden consequences of climate change, in particular, how hotter temperature may affect things uh, like labor and learning, and how that might inform our understanding of what one might call climate inequality closer to home. Okay, but let me start with a couple of high-level stylized facts that really motivate uh, this research, beginning with the fact that, as Kimberly laid out nicely, you know, we've got a lot of warming coming down the pike and, and rather quickly. And here, I just want to highlight one dimension of this. I'm not an atmospheric scientist, but my understanding is that you don't need all that much in terms of global average annual temperature increase to see highly nonlinear increases locally in terms of the number of extreme heat days, right? So there are some parts of the United States, for instance, Atlanta, Georgia, just to pick one example, where we can expect to see 50 additional days per year with highs above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That's on top of what they already average by 2040, 2050 alone. And as you get closer to the equator, or due to uh, other local microclimatic factors, there are some parts of the world where that number is 150 days, right? On top of what you already get, 150 days per year above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And all of this is, for the most part, at least until 2040, 2050, more or less baked into the system, right? Okay, so we've got a lot of warming coming down the pike. This warming comes amid growing inequality between what you might call the educational haves and have-nots of a society. Yes, between uh, rich and poor countries, but here I'm really trying to highlight between rich and poor people within countries, even in rich developed countries like the United States, right? So there's an active debate about the causes of these trends and the precise contributions, whether it's automation, skill bias, technical change, globalization, et cetera. But what's uncontroversial is the fact that workers without a bachelor's degree in this country have seen relative wage stagnation over the past several decades. And you see similar trends in many other OECD countries. Okay, so some of my own work uh, with other co-authors has been trying to understand and unpackage, you know, whether and how these two trends interact in ways that might be meaningful uh, for policymakers to consider, both in terms of thinking about climate mitigation, right? How urgent is the problem? What should we do about it? At what cost? In what ways? but also in terms of climate adaptation, right? How best to protect uh, the most vulnerable in society from the warming that is already happening, right? And already baked into the system. But before I move on into the meat of the data, uh, because a lot of this work is sort of based on big data and econometrics, I wanted to just pay tribute very briefly uh, to a scholarly giant who, uh, as many of you may know, recently passed away, um, who was uh, my childhood intellectual hero growing up, and this is E.O. Wilson because I think there's actually uh, a core piece of intuition to this research agenda that is sort of deeply ecological or biological in nature and is captured well uh, in this uh, passage by E.O. Wilson who says that humanity is a biological species living in a biological environment because like all species, we're exquisitely adapted in everything, right? From our physiology to our behavior to that particular environment in which we find ourselves. Now, and I think a lot of us will share this intuition, right? That like, not unlike Goldilocks and the Three Bears, we have a very relatively narrow thermal comfort zone as human beings, right? Not too hot, not too cold, just right. So if that's the sort of ecological intuition, for lack of a better phrase, and this is the, if you remember one thing in this talk slide, the economic intuition that I would like to impart during this talk is that the mapping from any given environmental phenomenon, whether it's a heat wave or a hurricane or a flood, to realize human suffering will often be a function of the social and economic systems in which that environmental shock, <clears throat> excuse me, occurs, right? 
And the intuition is that even seemingly mundane things like a hot day may cut in ways that are deeper for some than others. Okay, so I know it's hard for us to do this because it's maybe 35 degrees outside right now and it's also a Friday. But if you were to imagine that tomorrow was a work day and the forecast called for highs in the upper 90s, lower 100s, would that alter the way you planned and went about your workday? Which I invite you to think about that for a second. Some of us here probably do not have air conditioning because the buildings here are so historic and old, but that maybe detail aside, I would imagine that for many of us working in so-called white collar occupations, you know, hotter temperature during the day may be a nuisance, but not a central feature of how we think about our jobs. I think it's easy for us to forget that even in the, even in the United States, Right? There are roughly 100 million workers without a bachelor's degree for whom routine exposure to harsh environmental conditions, whether it's extreme temperature or toxic chemicals, uh, is a routine reality. Right? And globally, not to mention, right, there are upwards of 1.3 billion individuals working in agriculture or construction to industries that you know, primarily occur outdoors. And in particular, you know, my co-authors and I are interested in the possibility that how extreme heat affects your sort of workplace uh, environment and how that affects you as an individual may depend a lot on what kind of work you're engaged in, in particular, given the fact that different jobs have different baseline levels of workplace injury risk, right? So on average in the United States, roughly three out of 100 workers, full-time equivalent workers, will be hurt, seriously hurt on the job each year. But that actually masks enormous variation, right? That the risk of serious injury and illness in an industry like iron manufacturing is roughly 40 times that of finance and insurance. And so that's sort of what motivated, in part, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this project that my co-author Nora Pankratz and Patrick Bear and I uh, were able to partner with the California state government to engage in where we're trying to ask the simple question of how does hotter temperature on the job affect workplace safety? And I wish we had more time to go into the, the nerdy econometric details, but the long and short of it is that uh, we have access to the universe of workers' compensation claims in the state over a roughly 20-year period. So think all of the injury claims that ever happened in the state from 2000 to 2018, that's roughly 11 million uh, injury records, which we're able to link at the daily level, the local level as well, at the zip code level, to detailed local weather information to try to ask a series of questions, particularly around right, what is the causal impact of hotter temperature on, a, on injury risk on the job. Okay? And again, I wish we had time to go into the details. Happy to do so in the Q&A for those who are interested. But the uh, punchline finding is that it appears that hotter temperature significantly increases the risk of workplace injury. A day uh, with highs in the 90s or above increases injury risk by anywhere between 5 and 10 percent. A day in the hundreds uh, can, can increase injury risk by up to 15 percent. And, you know, there's still some work that we're trying to do to nail this down uh, precisely, but it appears to be the case that this is not driven by things like correlated changes in the number of workers and the number of hours worked. Uh, you know, to put very briefly, we're looking at daily temperature variation within a given zip code and month. So this is sort of net of seasonality or industrial composition or other factors that you might think might be correlated uh, with injury risk. So we're pretty confident because we're sort of lining up the data in such a way that makes it as if uh, nature herself is running a series of natural experiments, uh, we're more confident that right, we're sort of teasing out the causal fingerprints of hotter temperature on injury risk. And the bigness of the data allows us to look at it in ways that are, are somewhat revealing and frankly were a little bit surprising. So first, on the top, I'm showing you that same relationship between temperature on the x-axis and injury rates on the y-axis for three outdoor industries, agriculture, utilities, and construction. So there, maybe not surprisingly, you see hotter temperature increasing injuries. But perhaps surprisingly, we find also that in some indoor industries, namely manufacturing, wholesale, and warehousing, we see similar patterns. And that's, uh, from my standpoint, a little bit concerning given the many millions of workers in the industries in the bottom panel, right? Another piece of this that we were frankly a little bit surprised by is just how many of the injuries, the excess injury burden associated with heat, appear to be 
things that are ostensibly unrelated to heat at all. So on the, on the left, you see that uh, officially recognized heat illnesses spike on hotter days. Maybe that's not surprising. But on the right, it's showing that all other forms of workplace incidents, whether it's falling off of a ladder, getting your hand caught in a conveyor belt, being hit by a moving crane, these kinds of injuries also increase on hotter days, but in a more subtle way. And here's where I think what one might call the thousand tiny cuts problem really bites, right? These are relatively imperceptible uh, changes, but spread out across a much wider base, right, of injuries the social consequences add up quite quickly. In fact, uh, we estimate that relative to a world in which no workers are exposed to extreme heat at all in California, suppose everyone lives in Santa Barbara or something, you know, anywhere between 15 and 25,000 additional injuries on the job are being caused each year due to hotter temperature alone, routinely today. And this is not quite an apples to apples comparison, but that contrasts very starkly to official records of the number of heat illnesses that are currently documented. And we can go into the details as to why that, that, that number might be such a discrepancy. And we know based on other work, right, that these kinds of workplace injuries, in addition to the pain and suffering on the individual and their families, also has economic costs that are shared broadly across the entire society, right? Whether it's the lost productivity, the lost future wages, or even in some studies we see uh, increased risk of personal bankruptcy if you are seriously hurt on the job and hospitalized, right? So we share all these costs socially. Okay, but I think the piece of this research that I would like to highlight uh, the most is, has to do with the labor market inequality. And I, there's a lot of subtlety here, which, we have, which we have, I wish we had time for. But the short version of it is that due in part to the fact that lower income workers work in baseline, more dangerous occupations and industries, and tend to live and work in places with more extreme temperature, the net workplace injury burden associated with hotter temperature in California is much higher, much larger at the lower end of the income distribution than at the top, roughly five times larger for individuals in the bottom quintile versus the top quintile of the U.S. income distribution. So one implication of that, right, is that I showed you the wage inequality graph before, you know, climate change may already be exacerbating what you might call total compensation or labor market inequality in ways that headline wage statistics do not capture. So in ongoing work, uh, a graduate student at UCLA, Paul Stanier, and I are trying to drill deeper into, you know, who exactly are the individuals who are most at risk, most exposed, whether that's along dimensions of race and ethnicity, uh, access to health insurance, immigrant status, et cetera. And you know, there's a lot we could go into here as well, but I just wanted to highlight one piece of it, which is that access to higher education appears to be a very important component uh, in terms of determining the occupational choice set, right? What kinds of jobs you have access to, and therefore how likely you are to be climate exposed on the job, right? And the across educational group differences within racial categories actually swamps the across racial group differences in this case. Okay, so just zooming out a little bit, um, you know, this work, I see it as, as just one small part of what has really been an explosion of applied econometric sort of big data meets causal inference research at the intersection of climate change and social science. You know, some of my earlier work uh, used many millions of standardized test scores, whether it was in New York City or from the PSAT, some of us may actually be in these data sets, anonymized of course, uh, to show that hotter temperature not only reduces student performance on the day of the exam, but cumulative heat exposure over time when combined with differential access to school and home air conditioning actually contributes to racial educational achievement gaps in a non-trivial way. And without remedial investment, climate change may further exacerbate those gaps as well. And this is a, a sort of a, an emerging consistent theme across other studies in the context of maternal mortality and health, uh, crime, uh, et cetera. And you know, climate change is about way more than just extreme heat, but at least within the realm of extreme temperature, it appears to be the case that the, these economic impacts right, tend to be more concentrated for those uh, who are otherwise disadvantaged to begin with. So I'll end with this, just two sort of pieces of food for thought uh, in terms of you know, what the implications might be for public policy. 
Uh, beginning with mitigation, right? So to the extent that the current estimates of the social cost of carbon, which is a summary measure, it's just one tool that we use to try to capture how big of a problem climate change is, which then determines or at least gives us a sense of how urgently we should act and how much we should be willing to pay for it. To the extent that the current measures do not include effects of hotter temperature on things like labor or learning, and they don't at the moment, one might imagine that the social cost of carbon is understated currently, which would suggest more aggressive action that has been taking place. But I'd really like to also focus on a second dimension, and this is really just food for thought, which has to do with uh, the, the possibility that we might want to think more proactively and clairvoyantly about adaptation policy. And here, um, I'm humbled by the magnitude of the challenges. You look at the data, it really begins to, to dawn on you how, how serious and how quickly you know, these impacts are beginning to bite. Um, but I'm also excited, truly, by the opportunities uh, to engage in what you might call uh, smart data-informed pub public policy in a way that, say, we weren't really able to do with regard to the pandemic. We have a, maybe a longer planning horizon with respect to climate change so that we may be able to blunt at least some of the most severe impacts of the climate change that we've baked into the system while we get our act together to you know, aggressively mitigate greenhouse gas emissions to rein in the warming right from accelerating out of control uh, beyond 2050. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.